this Monday, this past Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, I and some other leaders in the church went down to Tucson because once a year, the Calvary down there, Calvary Tucson, they host what's called the Southwest Pastor and Leaders Conference. And there's, you know, 800 people there. So it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Now, one of the things they do is they give us this little notebook right here. This is mine. The, the RKA stands for my, my initial. I don't know if you know what my, my name is. It's Rajesh Kumar Ahuja. That's my full name. And so that's why RKA is there. So notice they have different speakers go and speak to us throughout, you know, uh, each day. And what we, what we do, obviously, I mean, I couldn't help it. You know how I always encourage you guys to fill in the blanks and what not? Look, I do it myself. There's, there's a whole bunch of notes. Really, the guy, by the way, did you, did you know that, that we actually have these for your notes? Did you know that we have three ring binders? Yeah, there's, there's holes punched in your little notes. And, and look how cool that is. It's like a, I'm, try, I'm trying to sell. I'm like one of those. One of those. Uh, if you, if you want one, we have those available out there at the Connection Center. Um, the theme was stand. That's why it says stand right there. And it's based on Acts chapter 5 and verse 20. And that's where the disciples are instructed to do this. Go and stand in the temple. In fact, the exact verse says, stand in the temple and speak to the people the words of life. And life is capitalized, the words of life. Um, I asked the guys, the guys that were with me, to send me some of their favorite lines from some of the speakers about that message. And let me read a few, okay? I've got a couple, actually, they're right here on my screen. Some of the stuff that we heard. One said, if your worth is in Christ, you can lose anything and still have everything. <laughs> Pride makes everyone sick except the person who has it. <laughs> uh-huh, that, that's so true. It takes faith to start, but faithfulness to continue. The greatest ability is availability. Leadership is not a title, it's a lifestyle. And these guys anointed speakers, and they're speaking about various topics that have to do with you as a Christian standing for the Lord. In fact, it might be kind of like this, if you could summarize, realize that you're just a person like everybody else, and you've got your struggles. You know, you've got your circumstances, you have your issues, but Christian, you have a call that's so much bigger than any of those things. And the Lord calls you then to stand and accomplish those things. To be able to, you know, take your little world and instead of focusing on that, you know how you can have just a little something going on in your life and that little something suddenly becomes everything in your life? Huh? It basically recognize that. And instead, you know what you do? You look up. You know, you stand for the Lord and really what you try to do, and look, this is a very biblical principle, is take on the perspective of God. Like, you're going to stand and reach to the Lord and basically say, look, my life is all about you. Would you give me your perspective, God, on life? Would you let me see it all through your eyes? And here's what happens, huh? In your heart, you just, you know God's love. It's, it's, the magnitude is beyond description. That's when you sense it like that. You understand that this God who is infinite, he has, an inf he has such an expansive plan that you look at your little, little thing. And I'll tell you what, it sort of fizzles into irrelevance. It sort of becomes irrelevant. Again, that's a biblical thing. Now, the tendency for those who might be suffering, can we say, a lot, 
or there's a new challenge that sort of hits you out of nowhere is to really, really focus in on it. And that little world that I'm talking about, it can become your everything. And, and our tendency as well then is to sort of sit down and say, God, look what I'm dealing with. Could you come down to me? And could you sort of take care of this? And, and I think scripturally, look, as, as is threaded from the beginning to the end, what is threaded is this, no, wait a minute. Come to me. Come, come, to, come to my realm, if we can say it that way. Now, don't get me wrong. When you have issues in your life, the Bible says you pray. You seek after the Lord. You seek his comfort. You seek his leading. You seek his, his you know, healing. That's absolutely true. But by far, the message of the scripture is, look, take Take, come to me and take my perspective and it just changes everything. It's it's to stand as a Christian. You know, uh, in Psalm chapter 73, there's a, I'm sorry, 93, the psalmist is writing this. People are coming against me. I've got so many problems and I was trying to work them out in my little world. And then he goes like this, until... I went into the sanctuary of God. I, I, I escaped my mini mess. You know, <laughs> this is a Rob's translation. But I escaped my mini mess. I stood up with God. I saw the world like he sees it. And I found this peace that I can't even express. Look, this is going to be on the screen. Psalm 93, that's uh, verse 28. It says, that I think it is 73, huh? Um, but as for me, how good it is to be near God. Not to say, God, come to my world. But to say, God, take me to yours. Uh, by the way, exclamation mark, his, not, not mine. So we do... That because otherwise we will become consumed by whatever it is that the Lord puts before us. Let me exhort you to this, Christian, in this day and age and in your life, you've got to stand against that. The the challenges are real. I bet you that if I brought 10 of you up here to say, what is your challenge? We in the audience will go, whoa, are you serious? You're dealing with that? Yet, like, that could take your life. Or that could, that could ruin your future. Or that could end a relationship that's everything to you. And we would just be like, oh, man, God. Or would you stand up here and say, wait, wait, hold on. You see, I'm seeing all of this through God's eyes. And would you believe it, that this smile is genuine? Would you actually believe that I have peace that is beyond what I can think or imagine? This is the message of the Bible. And this is the call of every Christian. Stand. Man, get his perspective on things. Take his point of view. This morning's message as I was praying about it this week, here's what happened. Now, we take the Bible from stem to stern, right? Teach every, every book, every chapter, every line. Um, we finished Ephesians, and so Philippians is next. Now, as God was kind of ministering to me through the scriptures, it went like this. Rather than doing an introduction to the book of Philippians, I want to do a lead in to the book of Philippians. Because I'm not even going to talk about any of the verses in the book of Philippians. And I'll I'll, I'll tell you why. Because I'm today going to teach you the whole Bible instead. I'll skip a few parts, but I am going to teach. Notice now our scripture verses. Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, verse 21. Yeah, that is true. Let me tell you why. Okay, I'm going to tell you why this is the case. Because Philippians is called the book of happiness. Did you know that in the New Testament, it is known as the book of happiness? In this little itty-bitty letter that Paul writes, he uses the word joy or some variation of it 
17 times. He's chained to a Roman guard. He's in there in prison for unfair reasons. And yet he is calling out to the Philippian church and he's saying, listen to this, my smile is real. He goes, my, my plight, my plight is real. But I want to tell you why this is the happiest book. Because I'm seeing it all through God's eyes. Because I realize there is a purpose that's greater than my itty bitty little world. It has to do with a plan, man. And it's a plan of God. This is, this is what it's going to be all about. And, and, and what I want us to do as a church, as Christians in 2018, and all the junk that's going on around us, is let's refresh our perspectives. You know? Let's get stimulated again. Let's understand the real purpose of why we're here and who we are. We are here for a God who has a God-sized plan. We're not here to get stuck in our itty-bitty little worlds. It's going to encourage us, I promise you. It'll compel us, I promise you. It'll exhort us. It'll convict us. But I hope you'll walk out of here with a little spring in your step. And then knowing that we'll get into Philippians, okay, next week. So here's what we'll do. Let's pray. And then we'll go from Genesis to Revelation together. All right, Lord, thank you for a really, really sweet morning. God, where we got to just sing with our hearts, with our lips. God, we praise you and worship you. And Jesus, who you are in our lives. And now, Lord, to come together and, and feed on your word. Lord, to take this in and by your power, by your spirit, have it work on us and change us and mold us and grow us. And Lord, we pray that you would empower us as well because we want to take these words and we want to live them out. God, we want to be the people you've called us to be. We want to fulfill the plan you've set out because we know that brings glory to you because we know that puts Jesus first. Lord, and also, if you brought anybody here this morning who doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus, uh, we pray today would be the day of their salvation. And we pray it in faith, in Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, says Genesis 1-1. In the beginning. <laughs> there actually was a time before you or I existed. Believe it or not, it's true. And God was still God. And God was the God of all things. And God was the God, okay, at that moment, the angels weren't there to worship him or there was no earth for him to have dominion over and on and on that goes. But he still ruled. He was still the God of the throne of heaven. And it goes, in the beginning, he gets going on something astounding. Okay, in the beginning, he creates. And he creates the heavens, and he creates the earth. And he creates, you know, the water, and he creates the land, and he creates the sky. And it says that he creates the fish, and he creates the animals. And do you remember what he does every time he creates? He looks back on the creation, and he declares, it is good. That's right. Um, um, verse 31 comes along, and actually he looks at his creation, and he goes, whoa, it is very good. What made him declare it? Because there's a reason. I'll tell you what it is. You know, Psalm 19 says this, um, the heavens, the creation declare the glory of God. Huh? The goodness God proclaimed and the glory that you see, those are, those are intimately connected. Okay, I want to tell you even more about that. Paul knew it. And he says in Romans chapter 1, check this out. He goes, for ever since the world was created... People have seen the earth and the sky. Uh, uh, through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so that they are without excuse, so that they have no excuse in not knowing God. You see how amazing that is. He says any human being can just look around and as they look at the mountains, and as they look at the clouds, and as they look at anything else, here's what they do. They go, oh. 
They, 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 they look up at the sky at night. Have you, have you looked up at the sky at night? And you just see that band of light. It looks like a lit cloud. And you realize you're looking at one of the arms of the Milky Way. It's, it's immense. It's amazing. And you're looking at these stars, but actually some of those stars are full-on galaxies. And you think about how we're just this little, little tiny thing. And we're floating around in space, but we happen to be just the right size, with just the right chemical makeup, just the right atmosphere, spinning at just the right speed, road, um, going around this humongous ball of exploding gas at just the right distance so that we don't explode, but we don't freeze. That, that, that you know, that, that, that there's just, I mean, there's on and on, it goes. And the Bible says any human being can look through that telescope or whatever and go, yeah, this is good. I see something here and it can't just have happened. I actually see the glory of a creator God. And this is my declaration and I cannot deny it. That's why God looks back at every piece of his creation and goes, ah, that is good. But what about when he created you and me? You know what God says? He goes, I'm gonna do stuff a little bit differently this time. He, he goes in Genesis chapter one and verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay, the, the plural, uh, the Trinity, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit in this dynamic that we can't even fathom. And we call them, you know, you know we call him God. And, and God says this, we want a, a, a something that will now serve a purpose we want a life now that will actually bear our image and demonstrate our attributes L like nothing else can. Look, a turnip is a marvelous creation and it declares the glory of God. You can just look at it and say, whoa, there's God. But you know what? A turnip can't love you. You can love a turnip, but a turnip can't love you. Um, a cow can't forgive you. You know, a cow can't show grace. But there happens to be one in creation who can solely. And you know what? Solely, it's you. It's man. There is a creation in creation that can actually demonstrate the attributes, the character, the image of God himself. This was his purpose is for us. In Genesis 1, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Is that just amazing. You are actually looking at an image of God right here. And I am looking at a bunch of images of God right there. It should just blow us away. So let's see, uh, or images and attributes, right? I mean, image and attributes. The first thing he does is he gives man dominion over the earth. Is that an attribute of God? You bet. Uh, dominion means power and control over. And he gives us dominion over the earth and all the creation and whatnot, all the animals and stuff. Now God, he has dominion over mm, everything. But it is still a demonstration through us. So right away he does it. Now as he goes through Genesis chapter 2, he goes to his creation. He says, listen, you got it all. Just don't eat of that tree. Now, being people, the first thing they do is get deceived, Genesis chapter 3, by the serpent and eat of that tree. And they disobey God. They, they say, you know what, we're going to do it our way. By the way, I've heard people, have you ever heard this? People say it happened because God didn't know it was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that, I've heard that too. Like, like what they're claiming is, oh, he, he looks at Adam and Eve, he goes, oh, are you kidding? I thought you were going to be just perfect. I can't believe this happened. Oh, woe is me. And God doesn't do that. You know what we see actually instantly, you guys? We see actually the most amazing attribute 
of an amazing God, and that's love. Because what you see at that very moment is a plan unfolding. What did I say, by the way, when they ate and whatnot? Uh, disobedience. And we know that when we disobey, when there's sin, there is separation. God and man separate. Immediately when that happens, this God of love says, all I want is them back. That's all he does. Instant. Uh, uh, roll it into, you know, make it roll out. Let's do it. And, and, and so they're Adam and Eve, and they're in paradise, but it says they're ashamed. You know, they're in their nakedness. But then it says in Genesis 3, verse 15, God goes to the serpent. God goes to the devil. And he goes, listen up. He goes, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. Of course, speaking of Christ Jesus on the cross. And you will strike his heel. This is God saying, I got a plan because I'm in love. And my love is this, I want them back. I want to restore them. I want them with me. And you ain't going to stop me. And the beginning is the plan put into action. And that's what the rest of your Bible, do you understand the rest of your Bible is about a plan coming to fruition? You know the rest of it since, since Genesis? That's what it's all about. You see it kick in in Genesis chapter 3. God's too in love with you and he's too in love with me and all he wants is man to be with him. He wants to restore man. Okay, but as you go through the Bible, here's the bummer. Just like Adam and Eve, just like they kind of separated themselves, man just kept separating themselves from him. See, in the plan, it went like this. Here's the equation. God goes after they see, they turn, equals disobedience and separation. And it happens again, and it goes again, it goes again. But you also see something really cool. Because there is a group that remains faithful to God. There is a group that actually says, Lord, you're coming after us? Okay, we're in. Now, the Bible calls that the remnant. This group known as the remnant is always those who God would say, I have made them my own. You know, I'm going to knock stuff off. Oh, I'm, I've uh, made them my own. And then he continues on. What does he do? He, he, he says, okay, I want to restore more. I'm going to bring, bring more back. And you'd go through the same thing again. They'd say negative on that. They'd turn their backs. But then you'd have a remnant that would say, okay, okay. Let's, let's get some examples in our heads. Uh, Genesis 6. How about Noah? So Noah, God uses to tell the people of the world, he's pursuing you. He wants to restore you. Stop your sin and come back. And of course, we know that the people say, um, nope. And so God brings a flood and destroys uh, everyone. Except you remember that there's a remnant? The remnant is Noah and his family. And they get to go in the ark and they're saved and then bam, they go out and they get to repopulate the earth. And we go on to a man named Abram, Genesis chapter 12. And this is where God says, hey, I know you're really old and your wife's really old, but you know what? You guys are going to conceive. And, and through this baby, man, the nation's going to multiply. It's going to be overpopulated, basically. And he goes, that's going to put my plan into action. Your offspring is the one that's going to crush Satan. And Abram is like, okay, okay. I mean, I can't believe it, but okay. And then their son is born, you know, Isaac. And then Isaac and his wife, Rebekah, they have two boys. And it's Jacob and Esau. And Jacob has 12 sons. You know, those, those um, uh, uh, God changes his name to Israel. And so those are the 12 tribes of Israel. And then one of them was Joseph. And remember, his brothers sold him into slavery. But some amazing way. What is, it? what is the amazing way? Oh, yeah. He stays faithful to God. He rises up to be the number two man. Right next to Pharaoh. And some really cool stuff happens because of that. Well, then he dies. And the Pharaoh turns on the people of God. And he takes the people and makes them slaves. 
Like they are totally oppressed. And so what does God do next? He raises up a man named Moses. And Moses says, listen, God's in love with you. God's pursuing you. Just come on. It's okay. And he confronts Pharaoh. And you know that whole story. They get out of there. Um, uh, part the Red Sea. Through it they go and they're out of Egypt. And what do the people do? Oh, oh God, we need onions. Oh God, garlic, please. We, we need garlic. And they're just complaining. It's, it's insanity, really. I mean, God basically says, what more can I do for you guys? I just pulled you out miraculously from under the Pharaoh. I pursued you this whole time. I made water come out of rocks. How, how could you say no to me? And then it tells us in the book of Numbers that he, uh, God says, because of that, I'm making you guys, you're going to be wandering in the wilderness for 40 years until this generation dies off. It's like, okay. And then what happens? God takes this guy named Joshua and he raises up Joshua and Joshua takes the remnant and leads them into the promised land. As this goes on, the judges are raised up. And you can read all about that, obviously, in Judges. And the people go, you know what, God? Ooh, we want king. We want a king like they have. And God's like, well, okay. And he raises up Saul. And, you know, it goes to David. It goes to Solomon. It goes to all of these other guys. Uh, in that time, in your Bibles, it would be Joshua, Judges, and Kings. Um, God sends these men to the people called prophets. And God takes these prophets and basically he says, I want you to speak the same message to my people. Be restored. Stop rebelling. Come back to me. And these guys are just saying it over and over again. They're even saying, like, do you remember this? They say messages like this. Don't you even remember when you were close to God, you experienced peace? I mean, don't you even remember that when you turned your back on God, life was the biggest bummer ever? Don't you, you guys were dying. You were starving. You were slaves. What did the people do? Most of them said, too bad. A prophet named Jeremiah comes on the scene. And, you know, he's really, he's got a great message. Jeremiah is a great message. And he talks to the people and says, you guys got the promised land. You guys got cared for in every way. But you rejected God. But God is so in love with you. He says in Jeremiah 3 and verse 12, Oh, Israel, my faithless people, come home. My faithless people, come home to me again, for I am merciful I will not be angry with you forever. All I've ever cared about, what got my plan going in the first place is because I want you with me. And Jeremiah talks a little bit more and he's going to look at all these guys. In fact, in verse 21 of the same chapter, uh, verse 20 of the same chapter, God even says, you're like a faithless wife who leaves her husband how could you imagine being called an adulterer by God in that spiritual sense? Wouldn't it have broken their hearts? No. And, and again, aside from the, the remnant, but over and over again, these people, it didn't matter what the prophet said, hey, too bad, so we're adulterers to God. And it eventually got to a point where God said, well, then enough is enough. And there was a, a period of 400 years of silence. And the people are like, God, are you even with us? Like, aren't we your people? But you know, they're just constant disobedience. They're just constantly doing the same thing. Now, God's plan continues. It's all his plan, right? He goes, okay, they've, they've um, disregarded my miracles. They've disregarded the leadership. They've disregarded my prophets. If I send my son... There is no way. Like if I give them my son and he shares this message and does what he's called to do, man, 
They're restored. And so Jesus comes along, right? Do you remember his message? He is like a prophet. His message was, be restored to God. Turn from your sin. Come back to the Lord. Did people say, amen, yes, we're all in? No. There comes a point now in John chapter, well, it's it, particularly in John, where Jesus basically says, okay, okay, if you're not going to believe my words, at least believe the stuff that I can do. At least believe me because I can do what nobody else can do. And you read now in the book of John, there's John chapter 9. Do you remember when Jesus goes to the blind man and he's been blind since birth and he heals the man? Guy is so happy. Do you remember what happens though to the religious rulers? By the way, the religious rulers, quote unquote, the men who are supposed to be connected to God, um, they go, hey, tell us how that Jesus actually did it. What is his ploy? What is his ploy? That couldn't be anything from God. Tell us what. And the blind man goes, look, I don't even know what you're talking about. But let me tell you what I do know. Um, I was blind, and now I can see. Like, yeah, right. Uh, John 11, uh, probably the greatest miracle that we see recorded of Jesus, Lazarus. And, and, and Jesus is standing there, and he just goes, Lazarus, come out. I don't know if Jesus sounded like that, but that's what he did. And this guy in stinky grave clothes like walks out of the tomb. And it says in that chapter, the people saw and they followed. So, but wow, it, well, people saw and people followed Jesus the way it was supposed to happen. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, except for the guys who were supposed to be connected with God. And it says in John chapter 12, they're so bugged by these followers that they plot to kill Lazarus. Like they want the dead guy dead again. <laughs> You know, get rid of the evidence and everything will be okay. How about, okay, okay, this is the greatest miracle, sorry. How about Jesus' own life? Jesus took his own life, he said. You know what Jesus did after that? He raised himself. He raised his own life. What about that? What do the religious rulers do with that? Deny it. Do they say no way? How could it be? There's a remnant. But there are the rejectors. What does God do next? And he's so loving. He's so grace-filled that he does do something next. Jesus stands in front of his disciples. This is John chapter 16. And he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you. When I go, when I go to heaven... I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And he actually says, the Holy Spirit will be better for you than I am. Right? In John 16, verse 8, he goes, and when he comes, here's the purpose. Ready? Plan. He will convict the world. And he will convict the world concerning sin and, and judgment and, 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 and righteousness. Here's what I want you to think there. Talk about God who's got an amazing plan. All of this time, God's ministry of reconciliation, of restoring, has been external, right? They've seen it. Some of them have gotten to experience it, but it's external. Here's what God says. Okay, now, now I'm going for everybody all at once. Now I'm going for them. He goes, now I'm going to change it from external to internal, because they are spirit creatures, right? We are spirit creatures. We exist forever and ever and ever and ever. And what I'm going to do is take my spirit to go and reach their spirit. He calls conviction. It is, it is evidence, I'll say this a little softly, evidence presented to show guilt. Not necessarily a guilty feeling, although that happens when we're convicted, but to show that you have wronged and there needs to be a writing, a R-I-G-H-T, a writing of what you've wronged. 
And so now, now um, G uh, Jesus explains. Firstly, conviction is going to be of sin. What does he mean by that? First thing is, everybody is going to know that they have sin against God. Everybody is going to know in deepest that they have offended a sinless God. It's going to be there because the Holy Spirit will convict. Now he goes, secondly, another, this other conviction, the other evidence is going to be righteousness. Ever, anybody ever tell you, you know what, I'm a good person? Like, like, you know what, I'm a good person. I'm good to go. I'll tell you what the Holy Spirit's going to do to them. He's going to go, <laughs> you know what? You actually know what kind of person you are. There's no such thing as a good person. You and I know how we are. That person goes and gets alone. They know how ungood they are. And this is what the Spirit will reveal to them. And then he goes, another thing. Like, he's hitting it from every angle. He goes, another thing, for, uh, judgment. And basically, that's this, you guys. Like, a guy like me 20 years ago, Mr. Atheist, staunch. There's no such thing as God. I just know that when we die, <laughs> we're done. There's nothing after that. No, Jesus said, inside, inside you'll know. You just know that you know that there will come a day when you will stand face to face with God and you will have to answer face to face for your offenses to this God because you're just going to get it. You're going to see it because you're a spirit creature and God loves you so much. Part of his plan is talk to the spirit. Now what happens, huh? Is this craziness or what? You roll into Acts chapter 2. And there are all the disciples with the, the huge crowds. And it says the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And so the Holy Spirit falls upon them. They start speaking in tongues. It says that they started speaking in foreign languages. Because remember, the people are coming from all over the world. And they're looking at the disciples like, how come I can understand what that guy is saying? Like, He's just a fisherman. He didn't take Italian in school. How could he even know what to say to me? But, they're, but, but the disciples, it says, in these tongues, they are glorifying God. And the people are getting it. And it was, and it was in, incredible, huh? But do you remember the people on the other side? What did they accuse the disciples of being? Yep, drunk, throwing back a few too many, and that's what got it. People just reject. And, and you read through the book of Acts, and people do the same thing again and again and again and then again. And God, God's like, you know, look at the universe Look at those bright things in the sky. Look at those clouds. Look at how blue it is. Look at the trees. Look at the mountains. Look at the water. Remember how I parted a sea. Remember how I brought the dead back to life. Remember how I love you so much I actually spoke to you at the core of your existence. Remember how I took my spirit and I actually demonstrated the power of myself. But all you ever did was deny. And all you ever did was reject. This is getting close. Paul, in Romans chapter 2, this is where he writes, hey, heads up. He goes in verses 4 and 5, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, Here's what's happening. You're storing up punishment. Because a day is coming, man, when God is going to come here and he is going to judge you. And all of that is going to be revealed. The punishment that you've stored up, it's coming. And you're going to experience it. And you got to stop. You have no excuse. 
You're still focused on your itty-bitty little world. Instead of saying there is a God, and that God matters more than I do. And in fact, that God has dominion over me. And if I don't give him that dominion, man, I am going down. How come you don't see it like that? Peter, forward to Peter, he gives the same message. So there's people going, oh, yeah, you guys are talking about how God's in control and God's judging and blah, blah, blah. I don't see God judging. I mean, if there really even is a God, how come he's not here yet? And Peter says, because he's so in love with you. Nevertheless, look, 2 uh, Peter chapter 3, he goes, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. Like some of you think. He goes, no, uh, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. <laughs> God is not looking forward to sending people to hell. He's not just going like this, saying, oh, I can't wait to strike them down. He's going, I need to love these people, but these people need to turn to me. And I've given them opportunities, and I've given them different ways, and my patience, though, it's running out. Uh, Peter says right after that, God is coming. But you remember what he said of God? He's going to come like a thief in the night. He's just going to come, man. And those people who've rejected him, who've made up excuses, they're going to go, what? God's going to say, I told you. And now my judgment is coming. You know, I heard somebody say once, those who go to hell, They'll have worked hard to get there. And it's true. God pursues them all their lives. All they got to do is look around and see his glory. Are you kidding me? But in the end, he's coming and he's going to expose it. And nobody, 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 and if this is you, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, nobody will get to look up at God and say, this isn't fair because I didn't know. No, that's not true at all. What God's going to say to you is, oh yeah? Man, I loved you and I went after you. You could have looked around. Yeah, you heard a sermon by some preacher, man. You heard about how you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. You saw the works of my son. You read about what it is that I did. You know, I've had some people actually tell me like this. Hey, I saw your Jesus in a dream. But, but they won't, like, they won't turn to him or anything. They just kind of tell me, hey, guess what? I saw Jesus in a dream. And I'm like, don't you understand? Don't you understand how much God loves you and he's trying to get you? He's trying to talk with you and he's even doing it in your sleep. He doesn't even care that you're a massive snorer. He's still coming to you and saying, I want you. No, they're going to have to work very hard. And I'll tell you what, though. God is a God of justice. He is a God of perfect justice. He says straight up, I'm going to have to judge because that's what a God of perfection does. So many signs and so many evidences. Oh, woe is me. You have the rejectors. It's coming. <laughs> okay, now we're in Revelation, believe it or not. So we come to Revelation and... Here's what God basically says. I told you so. And not only does he say, I told you so, but he says, I'm even going to show you what it is that's going to happen. You know, God's not a God of empty threats, right? You know, parents, sometimes we can do that, right, to our kids. And they know, right? If you don't come here, I'm going to count, you know, I'm going to count to three. And if you don't come here, you know, I'm going to count to three again. And if you don't come again, I'm going to count to five. And we just kind of go on. And God says, no, my promises are true. And these are the kinds of promises that you're going to wish weren't true. Nevertheless, I came after you just like I did with Noah. And I said, believe in me. And people didn't believe in me. And I brought the flood and I destroyed the world. And that's yet to come again. And Revelation 6, you guys, oh, that's one of those chapters that you just don't want to read. You're like, God, can't you break your promise here? Then everyone... This is verses 15 and 16 and 17. Then everyone, the kings of the rulers, uh, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, 
and every slave and free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, and they cried to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. Um, hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to survive? God's wrath is poured out on this earth of rebellers and rejectors, and, and it's everybody, it's the wealthy, it's the rulers, you know, it's the politicians, it's the actors, it's the actresses, it's the athletes, it's the attractive, it's the good, it's the bad. And they are in such torment that they actually look at the mountains and say, please, would you crush us? Would you take us because we can't handle this? Because his wrath is too much and we can't take it anymore. And then the craziness comes. Because it says in Revelation chapter 9, they reject him. What insanity, huh? But I told you, God loves, God goes after, God wants to restore, God wants to draw. But the people do what they do. And it gets nuttier. Because then you go on into Revelation chapter 16. And in verse 21, it says, uh, this is one of the catastrophes, you know, the wrath. It goes, it goes, there was a terrible hailstorm, and hailstones weighing as much as 75 pounds fell from the sky onto the people below. Check this out. They cursed God because of the terrible plague of the hailstorm. Just picture their fists up to heaven. Who do you think you are doing this to us? Don't you understand that we're good people? Don't you understand that you didn't give us enough evidence? Don't you understand that we're doing it our way because our way is okay? And they suffer and they suffer until finally it's destroyed. He's a God of love, but he's a God of perfect justice. But he's also a God of paradise. Did you know that? He is, huh? Because now you come to the end of the end. Because now, now, Christian, listen, you persevered. You said, I will be one of the remnant. That's why you're here. You said, I don't care what the world is trying to tell me. I'm not going to fool myself into thinking that I'm so good. You said, I am going to receive the restoration way. And that's Jesus. And then God looked at you and he said, oh, I love you. You know what? I'm so glad you've been drawn near, you've drawn near to me. I want to promise you something. I will always draw near to you. In fact, you're going to experience my goodness personally. We're going to take this back to how it all started. He says in Revelation chapter 21, uh, John goes, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea, it was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with, him, with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Oh, and he's not done. And one sitting on the throne said, look, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, um, write it down because it's trustworthy. It is finished. You heard those words before? Yeah, I have. On the cross. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious, will inherit all these blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. But he reminds, he says, remember that I am a perfect and just God. And he says, okay, I'm telling you what's good, what's to come, but I must remind you of what's not. And that's why he puts in verse eight, but cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Hell 
Hell is a real place. And in God's perfect justice, that's what those who reject, that's where they're cast. That's the truth. He goes, this is the second death. You don't want to die a second time. You want to, live, you, you want to die once. That's when you, you sort of finish right here on the earth. And you want to live twice. What does it say? Die once, live twice. Die twice, live once. Something along those lines. See, this was it. You guys, this is, this is it. This was God's plan all along. He goes, it is good. And when he was saying it is good, he said, because there is going to come a day when it'll all come to fruition right here. He goes, it is good. I'm going to have my son come. He's going to crush the head of Satan. And it's going to all manifest itself right here. Why would you reject me? Why would you reject God when that's the promise that will come? Instead, what you do is you stand, man. You stand. You, you stop looking down here and you say, there is an up there. You stop saying, this little thing is my everything because God is your everything. You, you stop feeling sorry for yourself. And say, because there's a God who has dominion over everything, even my little thing. You say, God is letting me go through this, not to make me suffer, but to prepare me for the plan that's going to come to fruition. I'm going to spend eternity with God, and I can't wait. You're going to, Christian, spend eternity with a, in a place where you could take a 10-pound rock, and you can slam your hand, and you won't feel it. <laughs> You'll laugh, ha, 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 I didn't feel that. There's no pain here. No tears and no crying and all that stuff, right? No death. That's what God wanted from the beginning. And he said, hey, I don't break my promises. I know what I'm doing. He created this world, it was good. He created you, it was very good. He calls to the rebels, I want you back. And some of them said, okay, but some of them said no. He used Noah, Moses, Joshua, Paul, Peter, and many of you, you believed in Christ. You drew near to him. He honored your obedience to him. He said, now I want you to be a part of the plan. Can we cycle back to the beginning of our message as we close? Christian, ultimately, the reason why these things just don't matter, I even went so far as to use the word irrelevant. That's a pretty strong word. When you're suffering from a terminal illness, how could I dare call that irrelevant? When you're suffering from a, a, a torment that is going to take you down to the depths of darkness, how can I dare tell you that it's irrelevant? And you know, when I say it, I'm saying because I'm looking at it from God's perspective, just like you should. Because he'll wipe away the memory of it or he'll wipe away the thought of it like that. He will actually say, hey, wait. Don't you see what I'm actually doing through you? Don't you see that you are a part of my plan that I put into action since Genesis 1-1? Isn't that so astounding? Don't you see that you personally, you are mine to actually fulfill it? Don't you see that when you look at the big picture, you can actually look at whatever issue you're at and go, holy smokes, that's right in there. I have the privilege of seeing it come to fruition. Uh, the problem in and of itself is irrelevant. How you go through it is what's relevant. The issue in and of itself, the circumstance isn't what matters. It's what you do in the circumstance. This is what God calls every Christian to do. We stand above it. And when you do that, whoa, look out, world. Um, I told first service this, so I'm going to tell you this too. Here's the answer to a question. Why do I even exist? 
How come I'm here and not there? There is a single answer in the Bible. There's one answer. The whole reason I am here is because God gave me a responsibility. And this responsibility is to do this, to stand and tell others to be restored to God. That's it. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, Paul says this, and all of this is a gift from God. Do you hear it? Do you see the perspective we're supposed to take? All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. You know, I bet you that in your Bible, if you open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that paragraph would have a header that said, the ministry of reconciliation. Well, this is where it comes from. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Now check it out. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. You understand, beloved Christian, son or daughter of God, this is your purpose in life. Your 401k is not your purpose in life. Getting that promotion. Look, let me challenge you this. If your 401k is doing well, you should have already designated much of it to the kingdom. If you are, if you are getting that, that raise, you are, you know, you're getting that promotion. Here's what you're praying about. Lord, how can I use my promotion to be an ambassador? Lord, how can I use those extra dollars to fulfill the ministry of reconciliation? This is the attitude. You guys, we're in a community of 100,000 people. Here's the ratio. Three to seven. Three Christians for seven non-Christians. And you got to remember, those three, they at least say they're Christians. Do we have a ministry of reconciliation all around us? You bet. Do you have to be like Noah or Moses or Jesus? You bet. And if we're going to stick to our own little worlds and make our little things everything's, we're going to fail. Would you please do this stand? I mean, don't stand, <laughs> but stand and take God's point of view. Would you please pray and say, Lord, let me look at this like you do, and it will change everything. Let's pray.